You know, we had a business meeting a few minutes ago, and in our business meeting, one of the topics that we discussed is how can we spread the gospel? Because that's what we're supposed to do. It is amazing to me how many people in the church and how many people outside the church they hear the truth. The grace of God is preached. The grace of God is taught. It's there. So many people walk away from it. So many people that have studied the Bible and become Christians will not reach out and grab the grace of God. The grace of God is what we're going to be discussing tonight. The grace of God. When we don't accept and live with the wonderful blessings that the grace of God gives us by being a Christian, we actually tie the hands of God. You know, sin separates us from God. And if I'm not grabbing and taking advantage of all the wonderful blessings that are taught out of God's Word that come with the grace of God, then I've tied God's hands. There seems to be a cry today for moderation in all aspects of spiritual life. You know, don't be extreme in any way, fashion, or form. In fact, you're one of those that attend. Every time the doors open, aren't you? Well, you know, I'm not an extremist like you are. You know, every time we go out to eat, you have to pray. <coughs> well, you're just doing it to get attention. You know, I can absolutely see where someone, after a while, would just step back and want to be moderate in his life. You go to church? Yeah. Where? Down the road. Now, somebody told me you're Church of Christ. Well, yeah, I mean, I go there sometimes. People are afraid to really be proud of what God's given us. You know, let's not go overboard on anything. I mean, let's try to hold back. Let's be moderate in all things. Let's don't really get into anything. But the Bible. If we follow the Bible, the Bible's not moderate at all. If I'm going to preach the Word of God the way it's to be preached, I cannot be moderate. I am to step on your toes, not trying to step on your toes, because I don't know whose toes might be stepped on. But this thing right here will cut you in two. The sword of the Spirit will cut your heart in two if you will let it. Biblical statements are very rarely qualified or limited. Uh, well, uh, you know... God says that we might ought to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first. Where does that verse at? Uh, well, God says that it might be a good thing to get baptized. Where is that verse at? Well, I'm just not going to really, really get hard on this baptism and hard on all these things you're talking about or in worship service. I'm not talking about reading about the book. You see, the Bible's almost always with absolute statements. Absolute. This is the way it is. And as we study the Old Testament, we see God means what He says and says what He means. He still does. He was, is, and always will be the same God. He don't play games, folks. Without any qualifications, absolute statements, and these qualifications that it has, or not so it can weaken the force of the message. And I have to give the same message. You just can't really teach the truth the way it ought to be taught. Sidestepping and trying to make everybody happy and listening to this and that. No, you just listen to this. As a preacher, you have to listen to this and you have to teach this because if you don't, you're guilty of sin. I don't want to be guilty of sin. You don't either. Ephesians 6.19 And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. You might not ought to say that. You might not ought to preach that. You might not ought to teach. 
None of us can be guilty of not being bold. We need to be bold. See, the problem with a whole lot of us, and I'm talking about worldwide, <coughs> that we're not Christian enough to keep from sinning. And yet, we sin too much to enjoy the wonderful Christian life. You know, if you're torn in the middle, you're just not a happy person. We're caught right in the middle, just Christian enough to be miserable, but not enough to abound in the joy that comes with the grace of God. We want happiness in Christ, but we can't have it unless we're willing to give Jesus Christ every area of our life. Well, I'm a Christian. I do this, but I'm too busy. I have to do this. I, we need to give Christ every area of our life. I cannot find a verse in here where it says it's okay if you don't want to do this by the Word. You can do what you want to, but everything else you need to do, can't do it. We must take down the bars of rebellion and resistance that who builds? We build ourselves. We keep God out. We tie His hands. I'm not going to get committed. I'm not going to get into religion like you want me to, God. I am what I am. Take it or leave it. Ooh, I don't want to tell God that, do you? All these things tie God's hands. We enter into the experience when we accept the graces of God. We find rest and we find peace. Peace really is the hand of God touching our aching souls. And this thing will calm you down. It will make you feel at peace with yourself and with God. All we have to do is reach out and grab it. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Working together with Him, that's with God. Then we entreat you, listen closely, not to accept the grace of God. What? Do not accept the grace of God. Well, I thought you would read the rest of the verse. Do not accept the grace of God in vain. What does that mean? Well, that is that you don't accept God's grace and make that beautiful God-given grace that was offered to all of us that most of us have taken advantage of. Make an empty thing in your life. It needs to be put into our life and it needs to be a full force within our soul and our very being. The grace of God liveth in me. Let grace as ministers of God, and I hope we all are, operate in us with all the wonderful attributes that go with that grace in our life. Take advantage of this gift. Happiness and joy awaits us all beyond anything we can ever imagine. Untie the hands of God. The grace of God, never resist it, don't distrust it, and don't be ignorant of it. In fact, let's put it to work in our lives. Paul's point, verse 1, is we don't need to waste such a wonderful, wonderful gift. That is available to us. The mighty resources that go with it. And I'm going to discuss a few of those resources. And fail to put them to work either because of, and here's why people don't, they're stubborn. I'll do what I enjoy doing and no more than that. I'm not going to give here. I'm not going to get excited. I'm not going to be a, a, a son of encouragement. I'm not going to look at the positive things of anything. I am what I am. Oh, you stubborn. Yo, mule, you know. And of course, people are too ignorant sometimes. And that's not stupid. Ignorant is the ability, not the ability to learn, but you haven't been taught yet. They're just not ignorant. They haven't studied enough, you know. Or they're just too proud. And boy, that's a big one. And of course, all these keep us from putting the graces of God into the intended use that they were given to us for. Paul says, don't cause grace to become an empty thing in your life. Utilize it. There's a second part to this appeal in, 
in verse 2. At the acceptable time I have listened to you and I have helped you on the day of salvation. This means that we have no excuse for anything less than absolute godly behavior under any circumstance. Now, I'm going to plan on trying to do that all year in every circumstance that befronts me, and I know you will too. Some of us may fail from time to time, and we probably will. But when we fail, I can't blame God. I can't blame this thing. I can't blame anything but myself. I have no excuse. No excuse whatsoever to be righteous and godly in God's sight. When I look at verse 6, I see so many blessings my life needs, and they're found in the grace of God, such as by purity through knowledge. The more I study this thing, the more I dwell on this, the more I try my best to understand it and apply it to my life and my heart, the more pure I will get. In verse 4, back up and talk about those blessings, I begin to see the attributes of grace. I see I will learn in the grace of God a thing called patience. In time of tribulation and distress, we have so many people sick in this congregation. We almost have more people sick than we do that are not sick. Those are tests of life. We have so many people here that have family problems. We have so many people here that might have financial problems. We have so many people here that are really on the brink of going on and visiting God forever. You know, we've got a lot of things around us, tribulation and distress. And oftentimes we find ourselves in a lack of patience. We need God to do something. We need to do it now. Well, that's not what we learn. That's not what we learn when we're talking about the grace of God. Uh, verse 6 speaks of any of us can be cheerful, courteous, kind, and patient. And courteous when things are going well. Well, anybody can do that. But I need to learn the secret of the right behavior under all circumstances. So let us learn to tap the resources of God because of the grace given us. He didn't just die on the cross so that I could have my sins forgiven. He died on the cross and He has given me so many things. And if I look at the Scriptures and study, they're listed right here in verse 1-10 through 10 of Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 6. A whole lot of them are listed right there. I will find joy and peace and I will find that anchor that makes me know I'm going to go to heaven. A thing called hope. I need to take advantage of that. A new year coming about. But how do we act when the pressure builds up? We go to God in prayer and we go to God's Word. And we find out how to handle the situation. But always remember what we learned in verse 4. I've got to be patient. God may not answer the prayer I want Him to right now. And He may not answer to where I want Him to. But I'm His child and He's my Father and He's going to answer my prayers. And what I need to do is have enough faith and patience knowing, wonder what's going to happen. I put it in my Father's lap and He is Almighty. There's no telling us what He's going to do. It's going to be great. And I just can't wait to see it. I will continually expose myself to the Word of God. Christ said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through truth. The Word is truth. It is the knowledge of these principles that sets us apart and enables us to be the kind of men and women that we must be. By long suffering, I dwell upon the patience of God as well as my own. I dwell on the long suffering or patience of God Almighty, especially in my life. And at the same time I do that, I want to apply that same type of long suffering and patience as a man for other people. I will forgive my brothers 70 times, 7 times 70. In other words, whatever it takes, as long as it takes, complete, completely forgive you forever. Because God will me, no matter how many times I ask Him to, He always will. 
and how shame that must make us all feel. I will show kindness in my life with genuine love, not a sentimental, silly type of love. No, a genuine love, a faithful and a costly love. A love that perseveres, that hangs right in there and is found genuine. Here we go. In the thousand tests of life. All these things that I've gone through in my life, all the things that you've gone through in your life, all the things that we're going to go through in 2016 shouldn't bother us at all. Because when it's all said and done, we win. We studied that in Revelations for nearly four years. In the end, no matter what happens to me, I win. I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven. There's nothing like taking advantage of the grace is given to me and the grace in our life to be able to go to heaven and act and live and sin and fall short and become weak so many times that we have in our lives. Is that not grace, brothers and sisters? I will speak with truthful, truthful speech. Now this is very important for all of us. With the capacity to speak the truth Boldly, no matter what the consequences may be, no matter what consequences may befall me, we must be truthful. Verse 7. It is difficult. It is almost impossible in some circumstances. But Paul says, grace will keep us truthful. I just need to teach, preach, speak, and be silent in the grace given me through this book. I want to take advantage of the grace offered to me for the rest of my life. I have the capacity to face and guide someone through Your Word and change their life for eternity, God. God, give me the boldness in Your grace to do just that. Answer my prayers. Because through Your grace, I can, I can pray to You and I can ask these things. I see the need to stir up others to love and good works. And oh Lord, I'm going to try to do that the rest of my life. And I pray that we all do. When is the last time you've done everything in your power to stir up the love and good works in someone? To raise them above yourself? To push them in front of you? When is the last time you took advantage of that wonderful God-given grace to you? Well, I don't want them to be ahead of me. Why? You're going to heaven. Who cares? Make him first. Make her first. Make them first. Support them, as we talked about in our business meeting. Let's support their ideas. Mine? Okay, but let's support theirs. Let's find a way to encourage one another in the grace of God. And you know what? With the grace of God, I will bring down every argument, every tower, every defense of rebellion. I will bring down the resistance and it will be torn down as I use what? The armor of righteousness in both of my hands. The Bible says on my left and on my right. I can take this and I can calm the spirits. I can take this and I can make us all understand that we're going to heaven and how to get there. I can take this and speak boldly and never have to worry about telling a story. As long as I go by the grace given to me in this book. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 8, in honor and in dishonor, in bad report and in good report, we keep on displaying what? The grace of God. When people look at you, they need to see the grace of God just shining in your life. The gifts that He's given you, and heaven awaits. Through all these things, no matter how bad, it, how bad it gets, we have to remain true. Isn't it a wonderful thing to have what we've got, brothers and sisters? In 2 Corinthians 6, 9, is unknown and yet well known as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and yet not killed. You know, I see all of us from time to time in our life, it seems that we're punished. <coughs> You know, the world punishes us. We punish ourselves. 
But I'm looking at you and I don't see anybody dead out there yet. Now, I don't know, I might be worried about a couple of things. <coughs> You're not dead. We're alive. We have the power within us. We have the God-given power in us to win, to overcome all obstacles and go to heaven. I know that I'm under a disciplining hand of my Father God in heaven. But I know that He loves me. My Heavenly Father loves us all and you know what? He's never done to us and He never will. He never has abandoned any of us. He has never forsaken one of us. He's always attentive to every want and wish and even the demand that we have. He's attentive when I'm sick and when I'm hurt. You see, to be able to be a child of God, baptized in the body of Christ, Galatians 3.27. Putting Christ all around me, Galatians 3.27. Washing my sins away in baptism, Acts 2.38. Receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And being added to the Lord's church by the Lord Himself, Acts 2.47. I understand, appreciate, and am so thankful to God for the grace that He's given me, a pure sinner, to be able to go to heaven, aren't you? Right. Second Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our light affliction, brothers and sisters, those of you that are sick, those of you that are getting old, and those of you that are worried about your loved ones that are sick, our light affliction, when it's which is but for a moment, and it's only a moment in real time. If a thousand years is a day, being sick a week or two, a month or two, or a, a decade is nothing. It is only a moment. And you know what it's doing? It is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We work our way through all these trials and tests of life for a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look into things which are seen, but to things which are not seen, the spiritual things, I've never seen heaven, but I know it's there. For the things which are not seen, or for the, for the things which are seen, are only temporary anyway. This is temporary. I don't know, I've had about 15 years, but it's still temporary. It'll go away. But all those spiritual blessings that He bestowed upon me, I can't see God forgiving me for my sins. I can't see Him on His throne. I can't see Jesus Christ. I can see pictures of Him hanging on the cross and I can only imagine Him piercing me with His beautiful eyes thinking, John, son, this is for you. You need it. And because I love you so much, the grace that I shed upon you today, if you'll only obey my word, you'll go to heaven. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Absolutely eternal. Now, this is the time. This is the time. Don't delay. Don't wait for some time in the future to look back on what has happened in the past. But begin to draw on His availability right now. Tell you what let's do. Let's use some good old Polk County language so we can understand. Let's all imagine us talking to God right now in person because we can in prayer, can't we? God, we want to go all in. We want to give our lives to You and we want to start right now. We want to take advantage of all the graces that You have allowed us to partake in. God, it's so wonderful. We all want to live that peaceful life on earth with an absolute a certainty of hope that we're going to heaven when all this is over. Everyone here tonight, and I'm looking at you, I believe has been baptized into the Lord's church. I don't see the children. There's one little baby. Two. But you know what? I see you raise your little hand. All of us can also take advantage of that absolute act of repentance 
if I let this morning I talked about things where the devil was holding me back, tonight I talked about where I hold myself back. I can let myself go. And when I lay my head down tonight on my pillow, I can be as sure as the day is long that I'm going to heaven because I know and you know exactly what it takes. If anything has held you back, do yourself a favor. Shed it. Get rid of it. God's got His arms wide open. He loves you. If you have a need, come forward as we stand and sing.